what we what we did last last week was looked at uh, the basic form of a signal, some signal made up of sinusoid components, and from that information about the frequency of the signal and the frequency of the components and the number of components in that signal, we can determine things like the spectrum, the bandwidth of a signal, and also relate the, the frequency and the bandwidth to the data rate which is the main thing that we care about. What, how many bits per second can we send? Let's talk a little bit a bit more about the types of data that we may be transmitting and how we can transmit that. So you know the difference between analog and digital. We've talked about that before. We can talk about analog and digital data, analog and digital signals, and analog and digital transmission. There's a difference between them. The data is the, the information that we're trying to communicate. We can have analog data like voice or digital data like text or a set of numbers where the analog data have continuous values over time and the digital data are discrete values. So that's the information we want to convey we can convey that information using either analog or digital signals. That is, I have my information, some voice, and I want to transmit that to another entity. The signals that I send can be either analog or digital. So they are the representations of the data that are transmitted from the transmitter to the receiver and we get what's termed either analog or digital transmission that is different technologies either use analog or digital transmission we'll, we'll finish on that one after we go through examples of data both analog and digital data and analog and digital signals some of them are ob obvious so an example of analog data is audio this diagram shows the frequency and the signal strength of different types of audio. Here we see speech or voice. When people talk, the frequencies that they generate range from the lowest frequencies of around 100 hertz here up to several kilohertz. 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. This is a logarithmic scale. So this solid green line is showing the spectrum of speech. And the higher the value here is the larger the uh, signal strength measured in decibels here. So the majority of people's speech is transmitted in this spectrum here. Music, the dashed line, has a wider spectrum. Music, which has not just speech but different instruments being played, can have much lower frequencies down to several or tens of hertz and some higher frequencies up to 10, 20, 30 kilohertz. And the human ear can distinguish the difference between them, those frequencies in some cases. So it's just showing the typical spectrums of different analog applications or analog data, speech or music. Some other information shown here is that, okay, this is the upper limit of AM radio. So when you, trend, when you have AM radio, you're sending music or, or speech. It can transmit up to this portion of frequencies. So wherever this is on the logarithmic scale, around 9 kilohertz. FM radio can transmit slightly more, up to 11 or 12 kilohertz. That is, FM radio can carry larger, frequ higher frequencies, signals, than AM radio. And comparing speech and music, we can see FM radio can carry some of the frequencies that are included in music that AM radio cannot carry. AM radio can ca carry music just up to this range of frequencies. FM can carry these frequencies as well. That's why you can get qu higher quality audio on FM radio compared to AM. At FM compared to AM. Another, so these are 
FM and AM radio are not examples of data. The music and the speech are examples of data. They're just given examples of systems that transmit that data. Another one that we commonly use is the telephone channel. So a fixed landline telephone, the telephone at home, is designed to carry a set of frequencies in this range. It's designed to carry voice communications. Voice, we know, is around this spectrum. The telephone channel carries this range of frequencies. So most of your voice can be carried over the telephone line. So when you talk into your telephone, not the mobile phone, it's different, but the home telephone, when you talk, the very low frequencies of a voice may not be transmitted across the telephone channel. And the very high frequencies would not be transmitted. But still the receiver can understand what you say because they receive this range of frequencies across the telephone line. So just two examples of analog data, speech and music there. On the other side, what about digital data? Well, here's just one example, text. And how do we get digital data out of this? Well, here's an ASCII table, or the international name is the International Reference Alphabet. It's showing a set of characters that we can have, English characters and some other control characters, and the mapping to the binary values. And the way to read this is that, okay, the, le the letter uppercase F has a 7-bit binary value, or is mapped to a 7-bit binary value, where the first three bits are 100, zero, zero, and the last four bits are 0110. Zero, so this is just the mapping from some characters into binary. There are different mappings, but this is a common one. So here is some digital data. If I want to send a message, hello, then using such a mapping, I would map that message, that text, into digital values. They are discrete values, bits in this case. You've seen this probably, or you've used this as an, you know it, as an ASCII table or an ASCII characters. So we can represent data, oh, data is either analog or digital. And there are many different examples. Video, and as an example, uh, is analog data. How do we transmit that information? Well, we send signals from transmitter to the receiver. The signals may be either analog or digital as well. And the signals don't have to match the form of the data. The signals are some representation of the data. Where an analog signal varies continuously over time and a dis digital signal is a discrete set of, say, voltage pulses. An example of a, let's draw one, a digital signal We can transmit at two different voltages, plus and minus five volts, as an example. Transmit for some period of time at minus five, and then at plus five. So hold the voltage level at the transmitter at some value for a period of time to represent some piece of data and at a different level to represent a different piece of data. A typical mapping, okay, let's say the low level represents a bit one and a high level bit zero. Then here's an example of a digital signal used to transmit digital data. So our signals can be either analog or digital, as can our data. Which ones are better? Digital signals are generally cheaper nowadays, cheaper to generate. The equipment to create these signals are generally cheaper. And interference is not so much a problem when compared to analog signals. But the problem with digital signals is they attenuate, they get weaker 
over distance more so than analog and that can be a problem. If this is the signal transmitted, this may be some this may be what is received, that the signal gets weaker over time. That is, we transmit at some power level and as that signal propagates at the receiver, it's much weaker than what was transmitted. That's attenuation. We're going to cover that a little bit more later, but there are some trade-offs between which signals are best, analog or digital. So some examples now, how do we combine them? We've got analog data and digital data, two different types, and we can have analog signals or digital signals. So we've got four different combinations. We want to transmit our data as signals. What can we do? If we're using analog signals in our communication system, an example of transmitting analog data as analog signals is the telephone system, the home telephone, not your mobile phone. The analog data is your voice. You're talking into the telephone, you're creating analog data, continuously varying voice or signal level, data level. Your telephone takes that and transmits that almost as is across some cable. Transmits your voice as an analog signal across that cable. So here is an example of analog data transmitted as an analog signal. The receiving telephone receives this analog signal and uses the input analog signal to play back the sound on the speaker on the receiving telephone. So that's a direct mapping from analog data to analog signal. What about when you're using your computer at home? You've got an ADSL link and you know that your ADSL home internet link uses the telephone line. Your ADSL modem is plugged into the telephone line, the socket on the wall. So in fact your ADSL modem uses the same telephone line and the same signalling mechanism as your normal telephone at home. That is your modem transmits analog signals but your computer generates digital data, bits. So what your modem does is converts that digital data into an analog signal. It modulates the data onto a signal and the receiving modem demodulates the signal to get the original data back and hence we get a modem, a modulator and demodulator. So here's an example of having digital data transmitted as analog signals. And that example is the, the home internet, say an ADSL internet connection which transmits analog signals across the telephone network but is transmitting digital data. What if we're transmitting digital signals? Your mobile phone transmits digital signals, not your home phone but your mobile. Over the air your phone transmits pulses representing binary values which are carrying data and that data when you talk is your voice. So when you talk on your mobile phone you're generating analog data, your voice. Your mobile phone takes your voice and your mobile phone has a thing called a codec and that takes the analog data and encodes it as digital data and transmits as a digital signal. So it codes it here at the receiving, say, mobile phone, it receives a digital signal, it decodes it and gets the original analog data and plays it on the speaker on the receiving mobile phone. So we get a codec that does this conversion from the analog to the digital representation. So home phones, the traditional home phones transmit analog data as analog signals. Mobile phones transmit digital signals. And the last combination is if we have digital data transmitted as digital signals and we get a device called a digital transceiver or tra digital transmitter and at the other end a digital receiver. It simply receives the signals and gets the original data back. 
So four different combinations and the, the appropriate choice depends upon the cost and, and many different factors and nowadays most of the communica new communication systems would make use of digital signals. The data doesn't change, we're still talking voice, we're still watching video, so it's still analogue in some cases, but most new communication systems will try to take advantage of digital signalling. But there are of course still many that use analogue signalling, especially your telephone network. I think that just summarises those four combinations. So analog transmission is when we have an analog signal and it's transmitted a through a communication system using a set of amplifiers. If we draw our source Signals, when we transit, transmit them, get weaker over distance. It starts strong and over distance the signal strength degrades or attenuates. So you can only transmit over a certain distance after which the signal will be too weak for the receiver to understand. Therefore, we can use an amplifier to transmit that signal across a larger distance. We transmit an analogue signal. It gets weaker over distance. The amplifier receives that and if we want to transmit to our destination it increases, it amplifies that signal. So it takes what it receives and magnifies that. So you know what an amplifier does, it takes the input signal and increases the magnitude. And it operates on analogue signals, the same as the amplifier for our audio system. It takes my input voice and increases the magnitude so it comes out louder to the listeners. With digital signals it's slightly different. Here we had an analogue signal where we amplified it. With a digital signal what we do is re have a repeater. We transmit our signal, it gets weaker over distance, this digital, if the digital signal is a set of pulses, it still attenuates over distance. A repeater takes that, this signal may be representing a sequence of bits from the source, we send the signal, the receiver takes the received signal, regenerates that sequence of bits, what it's received and transmits them to the receiver or to the destination here. So we still have the same issue that our signal gets weaker over distance. With an amplifier we simply increase the magnitude of our analogue signal. With a repeater we reconstruct the data and transmit again. There's a subtle but important difference there. Here we're not caring about what the original data is, we're simply re-amplifying the signal. Here we take the original data, transmit it, the repeater reconstructs what that original data was and transmits again. We can even use a repeater for analogue signals. If that analogue signal is representing some digital data, we can, so in this case if we had some digital data and we send an analogue signal, 
representing that data, where, for example, a high value represented one bit, a low value another bit, it would get weaker. The repeater doesn't amplify the signal, it reconstructs, it checks, okay, I just received the sequence 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and transmits again. This is with a digital signal, this is with an analog signal, but both cases we have digital data. Although it looks the same, we've just amplified it here, we've actually reconstruct reconstructed the data that we received and transmit again. If we have some noise in the system, and we're going to cover noise in some more detail shortly, but if we have some variations because of imp imperfections in the system, an amplifier will amplify the noise. It doesn't distinguish. But with a repeater, even if we have noise, we get the original data again and transmit a new signal without that noise. So that can be of benefit in this case because we're transmitting a new signal. We're not amplifying the old signal. So if there's some noise or imperfections in the received signal, in this case they will be amplified when we send it on. In this case, the noise will not be amplified. So, the example on the left is an example of analog transmission, where we're using amplifiers, and on the right is digital transmission, where we're using repeaters. As you, as you maybe you can hear, with our audio system, it's analog transmission. I'm sending analog data as an analog signal. It goes to the receiver here. And then we have an amplifier that amplifies that. So if there's any noise that's picked up by the microphone or any imperfections in this microphone and transmitter, the amplifier will amplify that noise. And that's a bad thing for the receiver because what you hear is my voice plus any noise that's come into the system, any imperfections. That's the case of using analog transmission. If we had a digital audio system, we still have our analog data. My voice is still analog. It, the digital system, say if it was a digital microphone, it would convert my voice into bits, into zeros and ones. Transmit those bits from the wireless transmitter in my pocket to here, this would receive, even though it's an analog signal being transmitted, it would receive it and convert what it receives back to bits, zeros and ones. If there was any noise, then hopefully that would be discarded. And then this will, will send to the amplifier and the amplifier will use that sequence of bits to transmit again through the speakers to your ears. And in that case, the repeater, if we had a digital audio system, is not amplifying the signal but repeating the data that was sent. And we can avoid the amplification of noise which can be better for our end reception. So nowadays in new communication systems, digital transmission is the preferred technology. There are still systems that use analog transmission. The equipment is generally cheaper, more efficient to combine signals from different sources. We can do things much easier like security. We're not talking about that in this course, but we can do things like encrypt the data much easy easier if we're using digital transmission. And repeaters can give more accurate data transmission as opposed to just amplifiers. So that's a quick coverage of that we have data which is both analog and digital. We may transmit that as either analog or digital signals, four different cases, and transmitting with an amplifier is and amplifying an analog signal is considered analog transmission. Transmitting with a repeater or a set of repeaters to get over a larger distance 
using either digital signals or analog signals is called digital transmission. And that's what's preferred today where possible. That summarises those three cases of the transmission where analogue transmission with an analogue signal, digital transmission with either a digital or analogue signal. Digital signals using analogue transmission is not used. It doesn't make sense in that case. We've mentioned several times, we're going to go through hopefully these two topics reasonably quickly and then on this last topic we're going to do some calculations and examples to bring it all together. We've mentioned several times things about noise. Well, let's look at some definition of the different things that can impair our transmission. I transmit my data, something's received, what are the imperfections that can cause problems for us? What are the impairments in the transmission system? If we transmit an, well, in both an analog and digital signal, the signal that we transmit or the signal that we receive is usually different than the signal that we transmit because of transmission impairments. I transmit some signal, the receiver receives a signal, usually they are different. The consequence of the differences, we'll explain why they're different in a moment, but the consequences are if we've got an analog signal, we have a lower quality analog signal. My voice comes out at some quality level with our communication system, the quality that receives at your ears, at the receiver, may be different from what comes out of my mouth because of the imperfections or impairments in our communication system. If we're sending digital information, we get what's called bit errors. I send a sequence of bits, 010101. If there's transmission impairments and I receive 010111, this bit is a bit error. 010101 was transmitted, the fifth bit is wrong. It's in error. That's what we call a bit error. So transmission impairments cause some degradation in the signal quality with analog signals and cause bit errors with digital signals. We, don't, we want to avoid both of them. What causes these problems, the degradation or the bit errors? Different factors. The main factors include attenuation and attenuation distortion, which we'll explain, delay distortion and noise. Let's go through, the, through those. Attenuation is present in all our signals that we transmit. The signal strength reduces as a function of distance. You transmit some signal with some strength at the transmitter. As it travels to the receiver, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. So that's attenuation. In different transmission media, the amount that the signal attenuates can change. Usually it's exponential. That is, if we see equ equations uh, as a function of distance, then the signal strength is proportional to 1 divided by the distance squared, for example. You double the distance, you quadruple the attenuation you've got a doubling or two times the distance, then the amount that you lose is four times. So the signal gets weaker over distance. That's a problem because what we want at our receiver, we need a receiver that receives, or we need the received signal to be a sufficient strength so that the electronics at the receiver can interpret what was sent. 
same as if I turn So we cannot compute in that com we cannot communicate in that case. I transmitted at some level this I could hear it. The signal gets weaker over distance and the people at the back receive some very weak signal but they cannot make out what was communicated. So that's our problem. We need our receiver, or we're not talking about ears, with computing devices, we're talking about electronics, takes the received signal, it needs to be able to understand or interpret what was sent. The signal strength needs to be above some level for that receiver electronics to, to work correctly. What is that level? Well, it, it changes depending upon the computing device. Also, the received signal sh should be much higher than the noise in the system. If I talk at some level and no one else is talking, then the person at the back can hear me. If I talk at the same level and everyone in this class starts talking and yelling, then the person at the back will not be able to understand me. So here's a relationship between the signal strength and the amount of noise in the system. The amount of signal transmitted which is not carrying our data, the noise. For our system or our receiver to work, it, the signal strength needs to be much greater than the noise. We'll see some equations for that later. So, since the signal gets weaker over distance, the main impairment of communication systems is that because it gets weaker over distance, we can only travel a certain distance before a receiver can understand that signal and receive that data. So most technologies have some limit, either some hard or soft limit, on the distance at which they can transmit before, if you go any further, the receiver will not be able to understand what the system or what the transmitter sent. That's attenuation. There's a related issue which is called attenuation distortion which comes, is relevant for analogue signals where attenuation differs depending upon the frequency of the signal. And that creates problems. We're not going to go into attenuation distortion or even delay distortion. You can read about the two distortion, two components of distortion in the textbook if you wish. Delay distortion, similar problems, different frequency components have different delays. That causes problems. You can use things like equalizers to fix those problems or improve upon them. The textbook gives a real good example of how both of the attenuation and delay distortion work. The other main thing, and we just gave an example, is noise. Noise is the set of signals from a receiver's perspective, the set of signals that it receives which are not related to the data that was transmitted by the transmitter. So if I'm communicating with someone at the back, that's our signal transmitting the data, if everyone else starts talking, they are con creating noise in our communications between me and the person at the back. There are four main types of noise that we can classify. There's thermal noise and this is pres always present. All devices, transmission devices, all media have this level of thermal noise. There's some characterisation. It's a function of temperature and bandwidth of it, bandwidth of our signal and usually it's quite low, especially compared to the other parts. So it's always present. There's some thermal noise that's received by the receiver. Usually not so significant unless we have a very weak signal. Things like satellites where we transmit over tens of thousands of kilometres we may have a very weak signal and thermal noise becomes important. But transmitting over 10 metres, 100 metres, it's very small. Intermodulation noise, when we send signals at different frequencies over the same medium, they can be received at the receiver and cause extra signals at the receiver. That is, 
if two people are transmitting in this room and a receiver receives those two transmissions at different frequencies, those two frequencies that are received signals may add together and create noise at a third frequency. That can cause problems for the receiver. We're going to quickly just classify the four types and then show you an example of noise, so the, the, the impacts of noise. Crosstalk is when we have systems, uh, for example, two cables, electrical wires, transmitting signals and they're nearby each other, then they can leak some energy and interfere with the other cable and cause... So if we have two cables running next to each other, both sending their signals, their own data, one of them can, when it's transmitting, leaks energy into the second cable, which creates a signal, an extra signal, that is noise on the second cable, crosstalk of the different signals. And the other case is impulse noise, caused by things like lightning, some electrical fault, some mistake in the, in the building of the communication system, where we have some peak of noise. If a lightning strike hits this building, then it's going to send a large impulse of energy through our communication system and for that period of time we'll have an impulse of noise. Let's show the impact of noise. That's the, perhaps the most important. We haven't distinguished what type of noise, just say, okay, all those four things, let's just consider them noise. We have a signal and we have noise. In this example, we've got some digital data. That's what we want to send from the transmitter to the receiver. We're sending it in this example as a digital, digital signal. And in this case, we've mapped bit one, the data one, to a low level in the signal. And bit zero to a high level. One, zero, one, zero, zero, one, low, high, low, high, high, low, and so on. This is just one example of mapping digital data to a digital signal. Noise, which is represented here, it looks almost random, thermal noise, we cannot predict what it will B over time. So over time, if this is a signal we're going to transmit, if this is the noise in our communication system, there's just some random variations. At some points, there's some increases. Maybe there's some electrical fault and there's some impulse or large increase of noise here. And some small variations, perhaps to, due to thermal noise, and a, another large increase in noise here, but here it's in a negative value. So, we transmit this signal and this is the noise experienced in our communication system. If we want to illustrate what's happening, We have our transmitter and our receiver transmitting across our communications link. We can think that this is the signal that comes out here and so on, comes out of the transmitter. The noise is the noise incurred across the communications link. So, and it's due to those different factors. It could be due to there's another cable that's causing crosstalk other frequencies being transmitted, it could be due to some electrical fault and of course there may be some thermal noise. In this example, we show the noise signal as this. So we can think that in our system there's also some noise. And noise is additive, that is what is received is the signal plus the noise, which is shown here. So we have what's transmitted 
plus the noise and we get the receive signal, which is, I cannot draw very well, this. This is over time. Time is increasing in this direction. Transmitted signal, noise in the system, receive signal, which is just the transmitted signal plus the noise. You can see the shape here that we have. If we give a value to this, this may be minus 5 volts, this may be plus 5, and this is around 0, going up and down a little bit. So it's still around minus 5, plus or minus a little bit, and then up to plus 5, but we add in this noise so it varies a bit here, and so on. So we can see the shape here of our original transmitted sig signal although we get some, ver some problems here, we'll see. So, what the receiver does, takes the receive signal and its goal is to work out what was the transmitted data. And what it does is it applies the mapping that's been used at the transmitter. The scheme we used at our transmitter was when we had data bit, bit zero, we transmitted a pulse for some period of time with some low voltage or low value, let's say a negative voltage. And when we had a data bit zero, I've gone the wrong way, I always do. Here, in this example, when we had data bit 1, we had a negative value or a low value. When we have a data bit 0, we have a high value. It doesn't matter which way around, as long as we stay the same at both the transmitter and receiver, as long as we know the mapping. Whenever we want to transmit a bit 0, we send a positive value for some fixed period of time, whatever time period this is, let's say one millisecond for example, then one millisecond and so on. That's our transmitted signal. Therefore what the receiver does, it takes the received signal and it expects every period of time to receive one bit. So what it does is it takes a sample of the received signal it measures the value. If the value is negative, so here's the zero level, it takes a sample at this point in time. If the value is negative, then it assumes that a bit one was transmitted. If the value is positive, then the receiver will assume that a bit zero was transmitted. And that's how it reconstructs the data. So this is the receive signal. This is showing when is the receiver taking sample. So the signal comes in at, at this point in time it measures the value. Minus 5 or minus 5.1 volts. Okay, negative. Therefore, I'll assume that the data received is bit 1. Some period later, it records the value. It's a positive <coughs> value. Since it's positive, I'll assume the data is bit 0. And we keep taking these samples and mapping the received signal into the received data. And what's showing at the bottom is just a repetition of the actual data transmitted. We see it works okay. Then we get to this point. Okay, at this point we measure it's a negative value, meaning bit one. Next time we take a measurement, it's a positive value, meaning bit zero. The receiver thinks a bit zero has been received, but we know that's not true. That is, what was transmitted at that same point in time was bit one. There's a bit error that's occurred. Why did it occur? Because of this increase in noise in the system. What it did is it turned our negative value into a positive value here. 
Because of that increase in noise, our negative value of our signal was received as a positive value and therefore the receiver makes a mistake in mapping into digital data. And that happens again sometime later in this sequence. Here this large negative value of noise adds to this and it brings the positive value down to a negative value and therefore we get a bit error. So this is what the receiver thinks it's received. This is what was actually transmitted. It's all correct except for these two bits. So there's an example how noise introduces bit errors into our digital data and our digital transmission system. Similar can arise, noise can introduce or lead to poor quality reception with analog transmission and analog data. Generally, the larger the noise, the more the chance a bit error occurs. We can think of this as random, some random variations, plus or minus some values. If the noise was larger, if it was going up and down like this, then more of these bits would be in error. The larger the noise, the more bit errors we have. So, what we've done so far, looked at the analog and digital data and signals, said that noise, there are different, or first there's attenuation, a signal gets weaker over distance. In the next topic we'll go through some mathematics that show by how much the signal gets weaker, but now we're simply saying the signal starts out at some strength, it gets weaker over distance, and we can have noise in a communication system and the noise is made up of different components. We usually need to measure it. We cannot predict what it will be in some cases. And that noise can lead to, for example, bit errors in our receiver making the wrong decisions as to what bits it thinks it received. The larger the noise, the more chance of errors. the larger the noise compared to the signal, the more chance of errors. If our signal was very large, that is, went, from minor, went down here up to here, and the noise was relatively small, then the noise would have a small impact on the number of bit errors. So the ratio between the noise level and the signal level is important. What, do we want, what we want to finish on today is some mathematical relationship between some of these factors, especially going back to last week's lecture of bandwidth and data rate and also introduce, introducing noise. How fast can we send across a particular communications link? That's what we're interested in. How many bits per second? and if I have a single link, I can send bits per second across that, the maximum speed, then we say that link has some capacity, some maximum speed, maximum data rate. So people talk about a channel capacity where that link is some communications channel. In some general cases, it doesn't have to be a single link. It could be multiple links. That's why we call it a channel. So what we're interested in what is the maximum speed, we can, maximum data rate which we can transmit data across a communications channel or link? That is, what is the channel capacity? And there are two theoretical models that different people have come up with that relates the capacity, C, or data rate. I prefer to call it data rate. It's the same thing here, capacity and data rate, measured in bits per second related with the bandwidth of our signal. Remember our signal has different frequency components from some minimum frequency up to a maximum. The width is the bandwidth measured in hertz. How does noise impact upon the capacity, the data rate, and error rates? 
impact upon the capacity. The first model we'll go through, the Nyquist capacity model, makes an assumption, comes up with a formula, so it relates capacity to those other factors, assuming there's no noise. That's not true. In all of our communication system we have noise. In this room we have noise. There's always someone talking or creating a little bit of noise. There's some background noise. There's noise from the air conditioners, from the environment, thermal noise. There's noise from the environment outside, thunder and so on. So, in real life there's always noise. But to keep things simple, Nike has come up with a formula that assumes, let's say there's no noise whatsoever in the perfect world. And Nyquist come up with this formula here. The capacity of our channel, the maximum bits per second we can send, is two times the bandwidth of our channel log in base 2 of M. We'll explain M in a moment. This is based upon the principle that given some bandwidth of B, say 10 megahertz, the fastest that we can send signals is 2 times B. That was part of what Nike was come up with. So if I have a bandwidth of 10 megahertz, the fastest rate I can send signals is 20 megahertz. In this example, we had one bit mapping to one signal level. Let's call this was level one, a negative level, and this was a positive level, a second level. So in this example that we've been through for before, we had a bit zero mapped to one level, a bit one to another level, one bit per level. In this equation M is the number of levels that we use in this mapping. So here M equals 2. We're mapping to two different levels of our signal. As an example, if we have a bandwidth of 10 megahertz, using Nyquist capacity formula, it says that the capacity is 2 times the bandwidth 2 times 10 million times by log in base 2 of M, the number of levels we have, is 2. You all know your logarithms. This is of course 1. Log of 2 in base 2 is 1. So it's simply 2 times 10 by 1 million, 10 megahertz, which is 10 to the power of 6, 20 million and we convert to bits per second. So the formula is relating bandwidth measured in megahertz, the number of levels, and capacity measured in bits per second. So in this case, if we have a channel where we can have a bandwidth of 10 megahertz and we're using this simple scheme, one level of our signal represents one bit the other level of our signal represents the other bit, just two different levels, m equal to 2, then the Nyquist formula tells us that the capacity of that channel is 20 megabits per second. We cannot send faster. And there's some theory behind the, this equation and this relationship. Let's try and explain what the significance of m. All the examples I've shown up until now, we've used this simple case. One level of our signal mapped to one bit. We don't have to do that. It can be more complex. This one, if I drew it, it was... I had a negative level, meant bit one, positive, zero, negative, negative, positive, 
positive. For example, with this scheme, this is our data, this is our signal. Let's try a different scheme. Let's try and draw it to scale or close to. Let's say a scheme we have where we can have four different levels. Say the levels are some voltage. Plus 5 volts, minus 5 volts. Just change the voltage of the signal. Let's try it different where we have... So this was minus 5 and this was plus 5. Where we have plus 5, minus 5 and something in the middle where we have here plus 1.6 and minus 1.6. Why 1.6 or 1.66 to be more accurate? Because it's the difference between here is a, the same. This is 3.3, should be 3.33, 3.33, 3.33. 3 four different voltage levels. And use those four different levels to transmit this data. With four different levels, we could have each level to represent two different bits at the same time. Let's introduce some mapping. If I want to transmit the sequence of bits 1, 0, I'm going to transmit at this level. If I, so this is for this first two bits. If I want to transmit the sequence of bits 1, 1, I'm going to transmit at this level. And 0, 0 at this level. This blue signal is a signal representing those six bits. We've just used a different scheme to map the binary data, the bits, to the signal levels. If you can see it. Minus 1.66 volts down to f minus 5 volts then up to plus 5 volts. That signal represents the same sequence of bits as this signal except we're using two different signalling schemes or signalling coding schemes. This mapping of this sequence of bits to the level, I can choose a different mapping if I like. I could have said plus 5 volts is equivalent to 1, 1. Plus 1.6, 1, 0. 0, 1, 0, 0. It doesn't matter about the mapping as long as it's defined. So now, this is transmitted. The receiver receives some signal at minus 1.6 volts for some period of time. Okay, 1.6 or minus 1.6. It knows that that maps to the bits 1, 0. Then it receives minus 5 for some period of time. It knows minus 5 maps to the bits 1, 1. And then plus 5 to the bits 0, 0. So if this signal is received, the receiver would map this to 1, 0, this to 1, 1, and this signal element to 0, 0. This would be the received data, which is the same as the transmitted data. This has two levels, this has four levels. The number of levels is the value of m in the Nyquist equation. The point is, and we're going to spend in fact an entire lecture or an entire topic on how we can do these mappings from number of levels to bits, it can be more complex than this simple case. 
Here we have four levels where each level represents two bits. We could have eight levels where each level would represent how many bits with eight levels? Here we have four levels representing two bits per level. With eight levels we'd have three bits. With eight levels, we could have a mapping that one level is zero, 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 another level, sorry, if we had eight different levels, this was plus five volts and this was minus five and these were values in between then we could say plus 5 represents the 3 bits 0, 0, 0. So if we wanted to transmit this sequence again, 1, 0, 1, we'd transmit this level, whatever the voltage is, and then 1, 0, 0, this level. So we'd send two signal elements. Each one of these, this is called a signal element. This is another signal element, one level. Except this signal element represents two bits. This signal element represents two bits. This signal element would represent three bits. So we said that the higher signal rate is two times the bandwidth. But the signal rate doesn't necessarily have to directly map to the data rate. It's a function of this log, the number of levels. The more levels we have, the faster we can send out data. Why? Let's say this signal element takes one millisecond. We transmit for one millisecond at one level one millisecond at another level. How fast are we sending? We're sending one signal element every one millisecond. Let's make some space. So now we have three cases. Case, case A, this first one that we had. Let's say each period here is one millisecond. To give us a value, then we're sending one signal element every one millisecond. So in one second we could send 1,000 signal elements, SE, per second. How many bits does each signal element represent? In this case, one bit. This level represents one bit, this level represents another bit. So in fact, one signal element represents one bit. We're sending 1,000 signal elements per second, 2,000 bits per second. If this period was one millisecond, we'd be sending 2,000, sorry, 1,000. It's getting late in the day. One bit maps to one signal element, 1,000 signal elements per second. We'd be sending one bit, two bits, 1,000 bits per second if each element was in one millisecond. Second case, this one. Each signal element is still one millisecond. That is this time from here to here that says one millisecond. So same case, we have one, one signal element in one millisecond, 1,000 signal elements per second. But each signal element represents two bits of data. So if we're sending 1,000 signal elements per second, it means we're sending 2,000 bits per second.
by using the more, more number of levels with the same rate at which we send the signal we get a higher data rate. And the third case if we drew it for this case. Still 1,000 signal elements per second. Each signal element represents three bits. We'd get a data rate of 3,000 bits per second. So, increasing the number of levels at the same signalling rate gives us an increased data rate. And that's this log base 2 of m is where the Nyquist equation fits that in. Let's go back to our example. different example. The telephone channel, your home telephone line for telephone calls supports a bandwidth of about 3,100 hertz. That's what we can transmit from the telephone across our telephone line. So, according to the Nyquist capacity, how fast can we send data across that telephone channel? Well, that's our bandwidth. If we're using this scheme, where one signal element maps to one bit, then in fact we have two different levels. If m equals 2, our capacity is 2 times the bandwidth, which will be 6,200 times log base 2 of 2. This would be 1. 2 times 3,100 times log in base 2 of 2, 6,200 bits per second. With our telephone channel, supports a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz, about 3 kilohertz, we can send data using this scheme at 6,200 bits per second. But if we use a different scheme where we encode 2 bits to one signal element, this case where we have four levels, it changes. If m equals four, same bandwidth, we're using the same channel, the same telephone line, then we get the capacity of two times 3,100 times log of base, in base two of four, m equal to four. Log of four in base two is two. we double our data rate. So changing this encoding scheme can increase our data rate. Sending more bits per signal element <coughs> gives us a higher data rate. Your ADSL home internet connection does not use this bandwidth of 3100 hertz, it uses a different bandwidth. Anyone used to have, or no one still has it, anyone used to use dial-up internet? If you used dial-up internet in the past, then probably you were limited to a, to a data rate of around 50 or 60 kilobits per second. Something like 56 kilobits per second. That's all that could be transmitted because dial-up used this telephone tr channel to transmit data. It had a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz. We had a data rate of, say, 60 kilobits per second. How? M was much larger. With M equal to 2, the, data, the maximum data rate is 6,000 bits per second. For 12,000, you can work out how many levels we need to get 60,000 bits per second. So, the Nyquist capacity relates bandwidth, the signalling scheme, 
more specifically, the way that we map levels to the binary data and data rate. And we see from this equation, if we increase the bandwidth, if I double my bandwidth, I will double my data rate or capacity. Increase in bandwidth increases data rate. We saw that last week. Increase the number of signal levels, increase M, increases the data rate. So, we want to increase the data rate, that's our goal, to get sent as fast as possible. So we increase the bandwidth, but we've said before that the higher the bandwidth we use, the higher the cost of our system. The more bandwidth we use, the more we need to pay to use that. So we can't increase the bandwidth to be very large because we have to pay too much. Increasing the signal levels increases the data rate. What's the negative part? Increasing the signal levels makes it harder for the receiver to interpret bits. So we cannot set M to some very large value because it there's practical limitations on a receiver and what it can receive. So there are limits on what that value of M can be. And in the telephone, the old dial-up modems, we could get a capacity of around 60 kilobits per second with a bandwidth of around 3,100 hertz. You can work out what M should be in such a case from that equation or an approximate value of M. So Nyquist capacity gives us a relationship between bandwidth and data rate when there's no noise in a perfect environment. That's the example we just went through. Shannon came up with a different formulation that relates bandwidth to capacity and he took into account noise. Because in real life there is noise. He came up with this equation. The capacity is the bandwidth of our signal times log in base 2 of 1 plus SNR, where SNR is the signal to noise ratio. Signal to noise ratio. Simply the strength of the signal divided by the strength of the noise. And we've tried to say before, same in this class, if I talk at one level and the noise goes up, it's harder for the receiver to receive and understand. So the lower the ratio of signal power to noise power, the harder it is to understand and receive the bits. If this is low, this ratio, our capacity is lower. If we increase the ratio, if I make the signal strength higher, and the noise the same, so the ratio goes up, then our data rate can go up. So if the noise, or if the signal power is much higher than the noise, we can get higher data rate. If the noise goes up, our data rate will go down. That's the a relationship shown there. We'll go through, um, will we? So this is a more realistic relationship between bandwidth and compa capacity than the Nyquist one. But we need to know something about the noise in the system and the signal power to be able to calculate this. In the previous case, we needed to know just the bandwidth and the number of levels. Now we need to know a little bit more to calculate this. How much noise is in the, is in the system and how strong is our signal? What we can see from this equation is that, again, increase the bandwidth, increases the data rate. Increasing the signal power. If the signal power goes up, SNR goes up, capacity or data rate goes up. That is, if I turn off my microphone and talk to you and then turn on my microphone and talk to you, you'll receive more information if I turn it on because the signal strength is higher. 
If we increase the noise, if more people start talking, you'll receive less information. If we increase the noise, the data rate goes down. If this gets larger, this gets smaller, and therefore C goes down, with the other things, other factors fixed. Some other issues that arise. If you increase the bandwidth, it generally allows more noise into the system. Make this bigger, noise goes up, which makes this smaller. So it may not help in some cases. And there's other things. If we increase the signal power too much, if we make it very strong, then we can interfere with other systems. And we can cause other noise on other systems. So there's a number of trade-offs that need to be considered there. That's a good task for you to do as homework. Use from this information, determine the Shannon capacity. And for that, you need to know something about decibels. And there's one handout that you have that explains decibels. You should have, may have covered it in a previous course. If not, you're going to read that handout. And we'll summarise on this tomorrow and move on to the next topic of transmission media. So let's leave it there. I advise try and go through these two examples of Nyquist capacity and this one of Shannon capacity and see if you can calculate it. I'm sure the answers are lying around somewhere. I think they're even in your handout. So try it on your own and we'll continue and, and give you the answer tomorrow.